So we're continuing our series in 1 Peter. We're actually going to be finishing it this week and next week. We're going to finish chapter 5. So you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, if I could sum up 1 Peter in terminology that maybe most of us could probably relate to, like, like teamwork, if you've ever been a part of a, a team, maybe a sports team, or, or a team that worked on a project at school, or maybe a team in the military, maybe you're on a business team, everyone's kind of has that, that kind of frame of reference, right? You've been on a team, and if, we're, if, 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 if ministry were a team, if the church were a team, basically what Peter is saying is that your team, your teammates are the people of God, right? You are not an individual in this Christian thing. You are on a team. We're, we're, we, need, we need teammates. And that our head coach is Jesus, right? He's also the thing that brings us all together. He's our unifying factor. He's our head coach, right? Our mission or our game plan is to spread the gospel, to spread the gospel. And Peter says that we should do that in action. He says, you know, don't be afraid to do good things so people can see your good works and glorify God on the day of Christ Jesus. So people would see the gospel in your life. But not only that, he says, you need to speak it. He says, don't be afraid. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ. You should live it and you should speak it. Both, not one or the other. You don't get to pick which one you're most comfortable with. I'm an extrovert, but I'm not very good at living it out, so I just tell everybody about you. No, it doesn't work that way, right? Or I'm an introvert. I'm just going to lead by example. No, you got to open your mouth sometimes, right? But the Holy Spirit will let you. So that's our game plan, and we do it together, right? And here's the reality. There's going to be some blood on the field today, boys. That's what Peter's saying. Like, it's going to get dirty out there, right? It's gonna, we're going to suffer. It's going to be hard, right? This battle is going to be hard, he says. You're going to suffer a little bit. And as you suffer, you're going to grow. You're going to become a better player, right? And then he says, lastly, our hope, though. Our hope is in Christ and in a future, victorious, glorious win. Amen. That's what Peter's been saying. And so... We're going to kind of continue into this last chapter. And in this last chapter, he's specifically going to be addressing the elders. And let me tell you a little bit why. You need to have a little bit of Old Testament context to understand what he's saying. So we'll, we'll, if, you open your, if your Bibles are open to 1 uh, Peter chapter 5, we'll go back a few verses. Because 1 Peter chapter 5, it starts like this. So I exhort the elders. It starts with a so. When you start with a so, that means it's not the beginning of the, of the, of the conversation. It means I've already been talking about something. And so, it means it's connecting with something. And here's what it's connecting with, I believe. It says in, in, in chapter 4, verse 17, Paul gives this sobering thought that you would probably like to skip over when you read this. He says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It is time for judgment to start with the house of God. Now this is, what he's speaking of is, is uh, he's referencing Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 is a point, now Ezekiel was a prophet right before the time when Daniel went into exile. When, when the kingdom of Israel was was overtaken, and they were taken into captivity in Babylon. That time in history, he's writing, and he's talking about that, and he's saying, you guys are about, judgment is about to come. You're about to face judgment because you guys are falling apart as a kingdom because you've already fallen away from God. Ezekiel chapter 9, but right in the middle of it, guess what he says? He says, and it's going to start with the elders, so this is what Peter says. He says he's talking about suffering, and now he's going to address. If it's going to begin with the elders, let me address you elders. As we face this future suffering that we're about to face, let me tell you how to lead. So it's very important. And, and you might be like me when you, when you read this kind of stuff, and you go, man, what's up with all the judging? Why you got to be judging all the time, God? Right? Like, the Old Testament's so different than the New Testament. No. Let me give you an idea of what this, at the same time as Ezekiel chapter 9, this time in history, in 2 Chronicles 36, 
He makes it very clear. This is why this is about to happen. This is why you guys are about to go into captivity. Because I've sent you prophets. I've given you every chance. I've, I've come to you. I've loved you. I've tried to correct you. But you would not listen. And so there is now no other remedy. So God's purpose in this judgment, this discipline, is future good behavior. It's for their good. It's like what we were looking at last week. Sometimes suffering comes. Oftentimes suffering comes. Expect suffering will come. And God always has a purpose for it. And here's a great thought that I didn't make up, but I just I want to camp on this for a second when you think about this. That God loves us just the way that we are. But he loves us enough to not let us stay there. He's always at work in our life. He's in work in Israel's life. And this is the idea of 2 Chronicles 36. Now, the bigger idea of the judgment coming to the church, he's following up with Ezekiel chapter 3, which is Ezekiel's charge is to be a watchman. Okay? A watchman. What a watchman did at that time is they would sit at the city gate. And their job was to look out over the horizon to all the lands around. They had a 360 degree viewpoint. And if any armies would come, if any natural disasters would come, if anything would happen, they would get on their trumpet and they would warn the people. <coughs> disasters coming. That was the watchman's job. And, is, and God is telling Ezekiel, you're that watchman. If you see disaster coming and you don't speak up, and the people perish, then it's on you, Ezekiel, because you're the watchman. But if you blow your trumpet and you warn the people and they won't listen, it's on them. Actually, this, this was such a big concept in, in the early church that in Acts chapter 20, Paul uses this language to describe his his interaction with the church. He says, I've come to you, and I've loved you, and I've told you everything that, that you need to hear. And some of you wouldn't listen, but I'm not guilty because I've told you. That's the idea of being a watchman. Bring it forward in the New Testament. What does it look like for us? Spread the gospel. Our job, our mission, is to tell people about Christ. To spread the gospel with the way that we live and, and with our mouths, with the message that we have. If we, if we do that and they don't listen, then it will be on them. But if we don't, it will be on us. So he says judgment begins with the house of God and it begins with the elders and so we need to take this kind of seriously. Are you guys excited? Sobering, huh? And some of you guys are like, well, I'm not an elder. Well, guess what? The elders, they do what everyone else is supposed to do, only they're supposed to be like examples. So there's nothing that the elders are supposed to do that, that we're not all supposed to do as far as character and, and, and mission. Actually, the elder's job is to, is to oversee the big picture so that we all as a church stay on mission, spread the gospel, because we are watchmen. That's the language that Peter's working in right now. We are watchmen. We have a mission. We're on a team. We need each other. We have, you're going to see in here, we have a chief elder who is Christ. You're going to see that in today's message. We have a purpose. It's to spread the gospel. It is going to be hard. We must stay together. And the elders must lead well. Because here's a, here's a fact. If the enemy can take down the leader, it takes down the whole team. I've seen it a million times. So 1 Peter chapter, uh, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 5, it starts like this. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ. Now remember, this is Peter. This is Peter. This is Peter writing with about 30 years of experience post the resurrection. He witnessed Jesus for three years. He was his, his, one of his, his chief apprentices of Jesus. That's a big deal. He was an apostle. So he was an apostle. But he doesn't come to them and go, look, I'm an apostle. Let me tell you what's up. He goes, I'm a fellow elder. 
I'm gonna, I want to speak to you as a fellow elder. 30 years of experience. I get it. And then he, what he references next, you can't miss this. He goes, and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. Now, this is Peter. He's referencing the sufferings of Christ, which is Jesus' last week in death, like we're about to do, look at in Easter. Is that a highlight reel for Peter? The answer is no. It starts off, Peter, Jesus goes, Peter, I just need you to stay up with me because I'm, I'm sweating blood, I'm anxious. Just stay up with me. He can't stay up. Peter's falling asleep. He's failing. Falls asleep many times that night. Can't even stay up. They wake up because, because Judas brings the people to come get Jesus. Peter gets all anxious. He doesn't know what to do. He starts waving his sword around and slices this guy's ear off. And then Jesus has to use Holy Spirit glue and put his ear back on. Fail number two. And, and Peter had said, like, I'm not going to fail you, Jesus. I love you so much. I'm, I'm with you. Urgh. He's doing this, like, whole, like, I'm a, you know, we got this game face. I got my game face painting my face. We can do this. I'll never leave you. Soon as Jesus gets facing suffering, what's Peter do? He, he starts to back up. He follows them. He's better than the other disciples because at least he's in the courtyard, right? He's not like bailed off to go on vacation yet, but he's far off. And then this girl, this servant girl, calls him out. He's one of them. He, spe he's, he speaks Galilean. I don't even know Jesus. That's how far he fails. The, you think that he's bringing up this stuff to go like, hey, I'm so awesome. You should be like me. No, you just, this whole picture would have been like, I struggle like you. I'm, a, I'm just a fellow elder who's been through it. It's hard. I've failed. But I've witnessed the mercy and love of God. He restored me. He can restore you. You don't have to be perfect, but you got to keep after it. Right? That's the, that's, the, that's the picture I think he's saying. It's like, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. That might sound like familiar language. Brittany brought that up last week. Romans 8.18 is one of my favorite verses. It says that these present sufferings that we're facing are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed on the day of Christ Jesus. Peter's saying basically the same thing. He's just talked about suffering. He's saying, but I will partake with you in the glory that will be revealed. It's almost like you get the picture that these key leaders like Peter and Paul and all these guys, when they went to the city, they actually like sat down and had coffee together and go, how are things going on your mission? How are things going on your mission? And they talked about some similar things. The glory, the future glory must have come up a lot because they all speak the same language. And Peter goes, we'll, 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 uh, we'll share in this, we'll partake in the glory that is going to be revealed and so he says to these shepherds, he goes, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And before we get any deeper, I want to kind of get into our notes a little bit and unpack this, which is the, the elder big picture. The elder big picture. Letter A is this. Who are the elders to be? The elders are like the, the, the responsible leaders in the church. As you can see in the picture of Ezekiel, go to the leaders first. Why? Because they're held responsible first. Just like Adam and Eve, right? Like Eve seems to be kind of the one that gets deceived first and, and sin, but then Adam, he, he's, he partakes in it. But who does God come to first? He comes to Adam first. He holds him responsible. He was supposed to not let that happen. The elders have that type of weight. And so we, the elders, we believe in... in uh, in, in, in our conviction is that they're men appointed to lead the local church. Men appointed to lead the local church. And that's our conviction because we believe it's the biblical mandate and we just believe it's, it's wisdom passed down over time after study. We believe that men are to take responsibility in the church. Men are not smarter. Just like we talked about with the husbands and wives, right? Husbands are not smarter. They're not better, they're not higher, highly, more highly valued, but they are to be responsible because God holds them responsible. And so m these men are to be appointed, and we see this in the local church, we see this in the Bible. In Acts chapter 14, 23, it says, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church. 
That's what they were doing in the early church. They were appointing elders in every church. In, in Titus, Paul tells Titus, he goes, go, when you're planting these churches, appoint elders in every church. Every church is supposed to have elders. Now, some churches, they call them different things, but every church should appoint elders. That's what the Bible teaches. That's our conviction. Now, I believe that, that the conviction is that, that men are, are appointed the responsible in the family to be the head of the home. What that means is you're not more important. You're, 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 you're not to be self-serving. You're actually to be the opposite. You're to, you're, to, you're to consider everyone else more important. And you're to be sacrificially serving. But you are going to be held responsible. And in the church, not every man, but men who are appointed to lead. That's who Peter's talking to here. Men who are appointed to lead the church. What are the elders supposed to do? The elders, and you see this in, in this text, they're to shepherd and to manage right? Shepherding is a word that can mean like pastoring, right? To caring for, shepherding, like you have sheep, you care for them. Managing, the word that uses is oversight or overseer or in some translations, bishop, but it's basically managing. So the elders are to shepherd the flock. They're to care for the sheep, right? And they're to manage. But I'm learning this the hard way, Kenny's uh, Confession 101. You're not supposed to micromanage. It's so hard for me, right? The elders are not supposed to micromanage. It doesn't mean no one else can step up and lead. We need everybody to step up and lead, right? It doesn't mean that everyone doesn't have a part to play. Everyone does have a part to play. The elders are not supposed to micromanage. They're supposed to encourage, empower, and equip everybody to do their mission and they're supposed to make sure that the doctrine is right and they're supposed to make sure that the mission stays right that we're like focused on the gospel that's what the oversight is supposed to be make sure the doctrine is good and make sure the mission is clear so that we're not arguing about the carpet and that we're not getting in fights with each other and 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 and, and hindering the gospel so that we're on track with what matters most in a macro managing type way and to equip everybody to do better, to make everyone better, just like a husband should do in his house. So, so, so the idea is to shepherd and to manage. How do, we pick, how do we pick elders here at Remembrance Community Church? Well, our eldership right now, we have four elders, myself, Duke, Mario, and Pat. And the way that we picked them is, the, is they go for one year at a time. It'll be up in September, right? And, and this is, the, this is the, the qualification, the wisdom that I got. The first thing is, and it's in your notes, is they need to be biblically qualified. Biblical qual qualifications. I'm not going to cover all of them, but I will tell you where you can find it in the Bible. And we've already done a couple teachings on this. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus 5 through 9. And if you read those qualifications, the qualifications are mostly about character. They're about character. And they're about th the condition of your, your relationship with God, your condition with your relationship with your family, the condition of your relationship with the community, and the condition of your relationship with the church, and your character, how that weighs out. Right? So in other words, if, if you get a guy that comes in, and he's the head of Microsoft, and he can lead a big, huge business... That doesn't mean he's qualified to be an elder. Character is a qualification for being an elder. And the second thing is this, overall team chemistry. And what I've learned is this, when you have a football team and it has a bunch of really great players, all-star players, or a basketball team with star athletes, and the head coach and the owner and the general manager, if they're not all on the same page, the team stinks. Because there needs to be chemistry. So I look for people that when I'm meeting with them, it, I'm, not, I'm not dreading meeting with them. There's got to be some chemistry. It is important, right? So we look for chemistry, qualifications, chemistry, and then thirdly, do they honestly have the availability? Listen, being an elder is not sexy. There's nothing romantic about it. It's hard work. 
You go, like, some people would argue, like, how come only men can be elders? How come anyone would want to be an elder? It's not that they're the only ones that can. It's that, the, that God wants them to step up. It's the job that you shouldn't want, but you should be willing to do if God calls you to. It, it, is, a, it is a spiritual warfare job where you are at the front of the line. I wouldn't, I, just me personally, I just, I think if, if it's me and I got my wife and three daughters and some guy comes up to attack us, I'm not pushing my wife out there. And, and if you do that, I'm sorry if you, you think it's judging, but I will judge you. You, you better man up. I don't care if your wife has a black belt in karate. You better get out there and at least try. If you get beat up and then she comes, I mean, hey, that's what happens sometimes. But you, 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 you better man up. So, so I, I don't have any problem. I know, it's, I know in, in a world sometimes this can seem bad, but that's only because you don't understand what an elder does. It, it, they, you should be willing to do it, right? But, but, and you need to be available. What, what Duke and what Mario and what Pat do behind the scenes that none of you guys see is incredible. Let me just say that. Incredible amount of commitment and work and prayer. You guys should be praying for these guys. I do all the time. I am so thankful for the guys that are willing to step up. And the things that we talk about and have to, have to kind of argue a little bit about and make good decisions on are the most boring <laughs> and life-sucking things sometimes, but these guys are willing to do it on your behalf, so that we can keep on task of spreading the gospel. That's the big picture of the elders, and that's who he's addressing. And, and he gets into it, and he, sa- and he gives them some practical advice. He says, how to lead. How to lead to the elders. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. That means there's going to be a local church, a flock that God is going to give you. They are God's sheep, and you are to shepherd them the ones that are among you, exercising oversight. And it gives you three practical things. He goes, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So there's three things there, and the first one's letter A is this, that we should do it gladly or willingly and not under compulsion. And what this looks like is this. You, sometimes you have a, oh, oh, a have-to attitude. You ever had that? Oh, I know I have. I know I don't want to, but I have to. Maybe you have that at work. You got a bad have-to attitude. I have to. I'm so, it's, I got the Mondays. You know, I can't wait till Friday. Uh, like, grudgingly. That's grudgingly. I mean, admit it. That's grudgingly. I do it too. We're all on the same page. Fellow grudgingly-ers. <laughs> Get it. But, but, but he's saying, don't do it that way. Do it with a good attitude. And, and this is just a, a general principle of the church. How do we tithe? We, we're to be cheerful givers. That's what it says in Corinthians. And you know, some people go like this. God doesn't need your money. Yeah, but he wants your heart. He doesn't need your money. But, he, but you need to give him your heart. And sometimes when you're holding on to your money, you just, it, that's the connection he's making. So he says, be a cheerful giver. Because it's a heart issue. Be a cheerful elder. That's hard sometimes. You know why? Sometimes you guys are hard. <laughs> I mean, I love you. But, but sometimes it's like, you, you could be like, oh, I have to do that. I don't like doing that as an elder. No, cheerful, willing to do it. You shouldn't want to do it because then I mean, you're probably in it for the wrong reason, but you should be willing to do it. And that's what he says, eagerly, not for selfish or, shame, or uh, uh, gladly, not under compulsion, not a have to, a want to, a worship, a want to because I love Jesus. And then he says, eagerly, not for selfish or shameful gain. Right? This is doing it for the wrong reasons. This would be like, you know what I want to be an elder for? Because those guys make money. <laughs> well, not at this church. They make, <laughs> they, they make nothing. Um, but but, but the, that's, maybe that's why we shouldn't pay the elder. Then they're, they're not tempted to do it for the wrong reasons. There is no temptation to do it for the wrong reason here. I could guarantee you that. <laughs> but this is a motive issue. It's a motive issue. They should 
want to do it for the right reasons. Not like, look, I'm an elder, and I'm so, you know, like now everybody will, like, will give me the respect I deserve. That's the wrong reason to do it, right? But do it eagerly. Jesus makes some great commentary on this. In John chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, he, he gives you this analogy about a bad shepherd and a good shepherd. He says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. He's the example, and we're to be shepherds like Jesus is a shepherd, and here's what it looks like, through thick and thin. Let me tell you something. My daughter just turned 16, Rachel. I could go on and on about the things I love about her. But one of the things I love about her, she's incredibly intelligent mixed together with thoughtful. I love to sit down and talk with Rachel and just hear what she has to say because genuinely she blows my mind. The way that she sees things is deeper than most of us. I love that about Rachel. And my little Kaylee, she is among so many awesome things, the most tenacious human being I know. One time we gave her a jump rope, and I mean, I'm such a good dad. I splurged 98 cents when we were at Albertsons. She gets this jump rope, and she, she, she does it once, and she goes, one. I'm like, well, I used to be a personal trainer. It has to go actually underneath your feet to be one. I wasn't really one, but I didn't tell her that. She goes, boom. Boom. This is like noon. It's like 9 o'clock at night. She's sweating profusely, and she got to four. And she was like, yeah, because she never gives up. And I love that. And you know what? I just love my girls. There is nothing that they could do that would make me turn away from them. I, I'm, I'm in it through thick and thin. That's the picture he's given. An elder cares for his sheep because he knows them. And that's what elders that's, that's the heart of an elder, the heart of a shepherd. And then he says, in letter C, he says, they need to lead by example, not domineeringly. I think a reason why we, we, we reject authority so much in our culture is because we've, we've had so many bad forms of authority in our lives that have hurt us and disappointed us. And so we just, I don't, reject authority. No, just reject bad authority. But what about this, what Peter's saying? Raise up good authority. We need that. We need elders who will lead by example, not domineeringly. Again, Jesus gives us an example in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 and 45. It says, and Jesus called them to him and said to them. And he's talking about his 12 disciples, and they're walking along the road, and they had, he had just basically said, look, I'm going to die on a cross and rise from the dead. And they were so profoundly moved by this this commentary that they start arguing about when Jesus becomes, when, when he finally establishes his kingdom, who's going to be the greatest? That's the argument they're having. Who's going to be the greatest among us? You imagine these 12 guys following Jesus. He's like, I'm going to die, right? Somber. He's like, yeah, but, like, what's my position going to be when we, when we get in the kingdom? So Jesus pulls them aside in this moment, and he goes, Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who, can, who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They're domineering. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It's an unhealthy authority he's talking about. But it shall not be so among you. Who's he talking to? Eleven elders in training and one who he knows is going to fail. Judas, right? And he says, it shall not be so among you. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know what that is? That's a job description for elders. That's their job description. And, and, and Peter was among those 11 that Jesus had referred to, and he's now a fellow elder. He's making 
disciple making disciples. He's an elder making elders. He's a discipling future elders because that's what the church does. They spread the gospel, they make disciples. And, and then the next section, we see that Jesus is the chief elder. It says in verse four, it says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So letter A here in your notes is this. The elders, since Jesus is the chief elders, the elders' primary job is to seek and follow Jesus. The elders' primary job is to seek and follow Jesus. You know why? Because healthy churches have healthy leaders. Sometimes you get a lot of stirred up, like, what kind of discipleship program do you have? I don't know about discipleship program, but here's, this is the way I look at discipleship. No program can disciple somebody. People disciple people. Discipleship is messy, and it's always in the context of relationships. And I know this for a fact. Healthy disciples make healthy disciples. Our, and the elders need to make healthy disciples who make healthy disciples who make healthy disciples who make healthy disciples. Peter was made into a healthy disciple by Jesus with all this training and now he's giving the training back. He's making healthy elders. He's making healthy disciples. We need to make healthy disciples. If you don't have healthy leaders, you won't have healthy people. But you know what? All of us are supposed to be healthy from the top down or maybe from the bottom where the elders are serving healthy. 1 Peter 3.15 uh, A, Peter had said this. He said, in your hearts honor Christ as the, the Lord as holy. What is he saying to all of us? In your hearts make Jesus number one. Make Jesus honor Jesus as holy. You know, I'm not an elder. If, if you hear nothing else today, here's your message. If, if in your heart there's anything that's in front of Jesus, there's anything that needs to take a backseat to Jesus, that's, it's time to do it. Maybe it's time to just, just reflect a little bit on, on your life. Is Jesus my chief elder? Is he my, is he my commander? Is he my lead authority? In 1 Peter 4.19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Last week, Peter, I mean, uh, Brittany brought up a great point that this word entrust in the Greek, it means to, to, to hand over something for safekeeping. What Peter is saying, he's saying, hand over your life to Christ for safekeeping because he is faithful, is what he's saying. Have you done that? And, and here's the point to bring it back to elders. What he's saying is that elders need to seek and follow Jesus. The number one most important thing for an elder is to be a Christian first. And, and not by name. What I mean is the, the, number one, the number one priority for the elder is to have a healthy relationship with Christ, is to follow Jesus. Your number one priority is to follow Jesus. It's your spiritual health, right? Like if the elder stops reading the Bible, but they're doing all kinds of other things, activity. If the elder stops praying, having an intimate relationship with Christ, they've lost, they've lost it. And the church will be affected. The number one priority is to follow Jesus, to seek and follow Jesus. And, and I believe our elders do that. And I believe that all of us are called to do that. A healthy church will seek and follow Jesus, led by the elders. Letter B, elders care for God's sheep. Remember this is Peter. Remember what Peter said after, after when Jesus restored Peter after the resurrection, he goes, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, you love me. He asked him three times because he had denied him three times. Remember that? And then what does he command him to do? Feed 
Oh, it's his sheep. That's profound. He doesn't go, hey, Peter, feed the sheep. He doesn't say feed your sheep. He says, feed my sheep. And what does Peter he say to the people, to the elders? Care for God's flock. That's what the elders do. They care for God's sheep. In Hebrews 13, 17, the writer of, of, of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. The elders are to keep watch over the souls, to shepherd, to care for. What's that look like? Sometimes you get caught off, you know, like you, you get like the sheep, sheep aren't great at following. I don't know, like the example, when, when Jesus says, we're sheep, I'm a sheep too, we're all sheep, it's not a very honoring picture, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Like when Jesus goes, um, the sheep hear my voice because I call them by name, the sheep are not the hero in that story, it's the voice, right? So the sheep are, are they, they wander, and, the, and we need to care for them. We need to encourage them, love them. And, 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 and so that's what, that's what the idea here is, is the shepherd care for God's sheep. It's a big responsibility. But here's the good, the good news. In, in letter C, he goes, he will reward the good shepherds. You will receive the unfading crown of glory. This crown of glory, in Greek, is the word Stephanos. I'm probably not saying that right. Stephanos, close enough. The cool thing about this is in Revelation, it says that martyrs, those who die for Christ, will receive the Stephanos. You know who's the namesake of this? It's the same name as the first martyr, Stephen, who was, who was killed for his faith. When, when they watched him die, it says these, these rocks were, were pounding him until he died. It said his face looked like the face of an angel. It said Saul, this guy Saul, was watching the whole thing, and it, it struck him so profoundly that later he would remember it and record it, and his name later was Paul. And he wrote much of the New Testament. Paul witnessed how Stephen died. Remember, and, and Peter's going like, Live your life so that people, when they see how you live or even how you die, they give glory to God. That happens. And it says, Stephanos. Revelation says, and when you're martyred, you get a Stephanos. But not only that, in Revelation it says that, but in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, a familiar verse, it says, do you know that in a race, all the runners run, right? Like everyone just does their thing, right? You, everyone lives, right? Everyone does something. But only one receives the prize. There's only one way to receive the prize. He says, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable Stephanos. But, but, uh, TIA, I had a TIA. That's, that's like a, like a temporary stroke. They do it to receive a perishable Stephanos, but we an imperishable. Dramatic pause. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But what is he saying? He's saying whether you live for Christ or whether you die for Christ, you get a Stephanos. You get a Stephanos. You get a Stephanos, like Oprah. <laughs> but not everybody. Okay? That's what he's saying. And he's saying the elders. The elders are going to get a Stephanos. Now, this is even cooler. Revelation chapter 4. It, it, John is looking through this door. John's the writer. He sees this vision of heaven, and it is glorious. If you read Revelation chapter 4. At the end, he sees 24 elders. And what are they doing? They're bowing down and worshiping Jesus, and they take off their Stephanos and they lay it at Jesus' feet. What are you going to do with your Stephanos when you get it? This is the picture I have. I think literally, you know, walk into heaven, I don't know this 100%, this is just my great imagination. Walk into heaven, high five Peter, if he's the one at the door, I don't know that, nothing says that in the Bible, but we'll go with it. High five Peter, right? 
I'm going to be like black eyes, broken arm because I, I work so hard, right? And God's going to go, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's mostly going to be because of his great grace, right? He's going to hand me a Stefano's and be like, yes, it's Stefano's finally. Then I'm going to look at Jesus. And suddenly, the Stefano's going to mean nothing. I'm just going to be like, I'll gladly just lay this down and, and, and I'm in the presence of your glory forever. That is the picture I get, at least when I, when I try to understand how this all looks. The Stephanos. We'll have the worship team come back up. Now, on a team, you have the teammates. And we've been talking a lot to the coach, to the, to the elders. But then, in verse 5, he, 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 he connects it, and, and we're going to look at next week at the whole, the rest of it, but I just want to look at, at at the team. Since the elders, since the coach has such a great responsibility and is working so hard for you guys, just like in Hebrews, love those people, make it a joy what they do. Really, it's in your best interest. And he, and he, and he closes it out and he says this in verse five. And we'll end here, go right into worship and worship the God worthy of all Stephanoses. Stephanoses? I don't know. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Three things, and we'll go real fast and get into worship. Number one is this. How do you be a great church? You need to have healthy leaders, and we need to be all team players. Everyone has a part to play. We need to be on the same page. We need to be team players. This is the picture he gives. He says, be subject to the elders. Remember, subject is a word that's a military term. It's saying, all be on the same page, right? Because he's going to get into, at the end, he's going to say, we are about to face a battle. Now, in the context of Peter, he's talking to a church that's about to get physically persecuted, but I would suggest that the job of the elders is to keep you on track, spreading the gospel, making disciples, and it doesn't matter. Anything that would get you off track, the elders need to guard you from. If it's persecution or if it's too much comfort, which might be our case. Too complacent. Oh, it's hot today. Friday? Friday? You gotta go serve people on Friday? Thank God it's Friday, that's my day, right? No, no, get you on track, right? For a people who can easily get off track with the one million distractions of this glorious land that we live in and to keep us on, on track. And, and we need to realize we're all on a team. And sometimes the elders will make decisions, I don't understand it. You can ask them about it, but I would suggest be respectful but, but remember, they're fighting for you and we're all on the same team. That's what he says. Now the idea here also could be that the elders mean the elders here, and some people would suggest that Peter's talking about actually just older people, like younger people, older people. That works too. I'll give you a, a point for that. Seek to be mentored. We should seek to be mentored. You know how to be a good follower in the church? Be a team player. Seek to be mentored. Seek to be discipled. What does that look like? It looks like go to Jerry, who's about to have surgery. Be praying for Jer uh, Jerry on Thursday. He's going to get surgery. But if you guys, if you young men, if you've never heard Jerry's story, stories, you need to sit down with Jerry. I'm telling you, he has a lot of wisdom to share. You need to hang out with Duke. And don't go, hey, Duke, um, can, can you take me out to coffee? Go, Duke, do you have a car? Because I want to come wash it. And hang out with him while you wash his car. <laughs> That's Duke. Young ladies. Young ladies. Be proactive. Go to, go to Barbara Green's Bible study. Do you guys know she does an awesome Bible study every Thursday? And you guys are welcome. Ask her about it. AKA, that's my mom. <laughs> go, go find Cassie and, and young ladies and, and ask her to teach you a new recipe. Or Sue Banda. Or anybody. Seek to be mentored. Don't wait to be mentored. That's what he's saying. 
And then he says pride hinders and destroys health. We're going to cover that a lot next week. I want to leave you with this picture. We're a team. Everyone sitting next to you is your teammate. If one goes down, the whole team suffers. If one person slacks off, the whole team suffers. If one person is discouraged, the whole team suffers. So we need to love and encourage each other. And we need to remember that our coach is Christ. And that if we have leaders that are taking the time to seek and follow, then you're actually, by following their lead, you're following Christ. That's the picture. You want to follow Jesus? You, you, you can't rebel against the authority of the church. Unpopular as that is, go tweet it. Because it's true. Because he's our head coach, and the elders are, are, are commanded to lead. That we have a mission to spread the gospel and make disciples. And it is going to be hard. But you know what? One day, if you live for Christ, or if you die for Christ, you're going to get in a line. Maybe it's a line. You're gonna, they're going to be handing out Stephanos. you be like, what do I do with this Stephanos? You're going to take one look at Jesus. You're going to know exactly what to do. You're going to walk over. You're going to lay it at his feet. And you're going to worship him because you will not be able not to. And that's who we're going to worship right now.